Don't you think it's time for the city of Savannah to have an honest tourism management plan? Let SCAD start paying its fair share? And the hospitality industry needs to increase its wages? The impacts of new growth should not cost residents. All local elected officials on council and commission should have term limits. We're working hard to accomplish these policies. We need your help. Please contribute whatever you can, five, 10 or $20, by going to bettersavannah.org. Donate. Thank you. The following show and broadcast is a production of Better Savannah, an independent expenditure committee dedicated to better policy outcomes at the state and local level. The views, opinions, and statements made by the hosts and or their guests do not necessarily reflect the views of Better Savannah. What's up, everybody? It's Chuck and John here on Hard to Believe It, John, episode 43, uh, Better Savannah, um, here on our weekly regular show. Uh, it's a pleasure to be joined this week by none other than Terry Tolbert. Uh, Terry has a long history here in Savannah, a lifelong Savannian, um, is uh, currently the CEO of EOA, Economic Opportunity Authority. Uh, and is the chairman of the Board of Assessors of Chatham County's government, uh, one of the key functional pieces of, of local government that uh, develops, implements, uh, and executes tax policy for real property. Uh, uh, do I have that right, Terry? I know that you've got a long history here. There's so many other things that could be said about you, and I'll, I'll post your full bio when we post the show later this week. But uh, how's it going this evening? It's going good. Let me just say I'm the interim executive director of EOA yes. and um, the tax assessor's office uh, only set value of property. Uh, it doesn't implement taxes, uh, but it only ensures according to state statute that we make certain that um, the values are fairly done. Um, and so that's what we do. We set value and local government determines the taxation. Oh, yes. Yeah. No, not not the not the tax rate, but uh, just the valuation pro policy and processes uh, for sure. Uh, so we were talking just before we got on. I, wa I want to start with kind of just the news of the day, which is crime. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not asking for you to speak on behalf of anybody else in your household. But, you know, your, your, <laughs> your, your wife has a long story career in, in local police here. So you, you've obviously had a front row seat whether it's the Ricky Gibbons era or the uh, Willie Lovett uh, debacle. Um, you know, we've had this recent uptick in crime the last five or six weeks as the weather warms. Um, 
what are your just thoughts on 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 the local crime wave and and the response so far from elected leaders? Well, I think um, the local local elected officials are doing everything that they possibly can because uh, there's nothing you can do to stop a crime once it's committed. You know what you would do is what you do after the fact. Uh, if somebody came in with a, a weapon to harm another person, you don't have enough police officers on the street to stop that from occurring. Um, so uh, now the question is, uh, how do you stop it? Uh, that's a very difficult task to do, uh, in my opinion. But it is uh, it comes in, in, in different times. Uh, this summer just happens to be one of those rare moments that I, I, I have not really read a lot on what's going on with crime in Savannah for a lot, a lot of reasons. But I did hear about uh, the one in which somebody came in and, and shot several people. And uh, I, I think that two people passed away. Uh, there was also a, a crime that, I don't know if you call it a crime, but somebody was decapitated by uh, a vehicle that was pursuing somebody in, in a criminal activity. And this person was decapitated. Uh, and I could have that wrong. Well, one of our major policy pieces here at Better Savannah is for the police staffing levels to be reflected across all appropriate populations. And what I mean, what I mean by that, Terry, is, you know, they'll tell you that we have so many police officers per thousand residents, right? It's 145,000 people in Savannah, you know, whatever number of officers divided by that, that we currently actually have, who knows what the actual number is. Uh, that's what they're using. But as, as you know, you know, on any given Friday night in Savannah, you know, there's there's 10 to 15,000 college students. There's five to 10,000 military personnel. There's, you know, anywhere between 30 to 200,000 tourists. You know, uh, do you think that it's more appropriate to develop staffing levels based on the totality of those averages rather than just the base 145,000 resident number? Well, it depends. You have to direct your force where it's most needed at. So I'm sure that the numbers that you were counting in term, terms of, of of the number of people off during the weekend, it's, um, certainly that you need to uh, invest your, your, your staffing in the downtown area to prevent any crimes that may occur um, because people are so situated. Uh, the question is, where is most of the crime occurring at? Is it downtown or is it in other parts of the city? And if if it is not in the other parts of the city, that's an issue. I remember years ago uh, that the city of Savannah uh, came up with a crime uh, policy that if you walked in the lanes, that you would be incarcerated. Well, that only occurred in the downtown area. Uh, if people are, are, and I grew up being growing up in the downtown area, we walk through the lanes all the time. Uh, but that's not certainly the case now in other parts of the city and has never been that in an issue of other parts of the city. So the question is, where do you put your resources at? Uh, I, I assume that people who live in places like Tatumville and West Savannah, when they have crime issues, don't have as much police presence in those neighborhoods as you do in the downtown area. You know, John, it just kind of to me becomes a self-fulfilling cycle where, you know, the, the downtown is the moneymaker for this city. So we protect downtown and the crime goes on elsewhere, almost unabated because there's not enough uh, resources. Well, you know, the thing is that if you look back at the history of policing in America, police based on historical information was started to protect people who had had uh, who had things. It wasn't designed to protect everybody else. And so nothing has changed over the history of policing in this country that the police departments have primary mission has been to protect the assets of those people who have things in their communities. John. Tax policy. <laughs> I know you want to get, we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. We're, 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 we're going we're gonna to get to that topic here in just a little bit, but I, I just want to stay on this crime topic because I know it's the news of the day. And I know that the staffing level issue is probably one of our top eight core policies at better Savannah, John. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll toss a couple thoughts out on the, on the topic. Um, you know, to, to, 
be a police officer. Uh, I, Terry, it's, it's how many hours of training? I, no, I can't tell you that. That's not my area of expertise. Yeah. I, don't, I don't really know. Okay, it's. Uh, I think it's twelve weeks. Uh, I could be wrong. Might be sixteen. Um, and you know, a teacher makes more than a police officer, and they they, they have four year college degrees, and many of them have an advanced degree. Um, you know, they probably have on average from four to eight years of college and specialty training. And uh, the police officer uh, gets a, a measly, uh, you know, 12 week training period. So um, I, I understand that the danger exists perhaps more, more greatly in, in the profession of law enforcement compared to education, but I think it's a statement uh, of disparity in terms of what we're willing to pay for. I think uh, police officers ought to be paid uh, more than teachers. Um, and I think uh, concurrently, they should have uh, a four-year degree to be a police officer. Um, I just think you get what you pay for. And Savannah has historically um, been a, a springboard in, in, into the careers of law enforcement officers. They don't stay here very long. They don't stay here very long, mostly because the pay is so low and they're overworked. So we're, we're not going to fix uh, police staffing levels, whether you count the real population or the census population, um, without paying attention to what we're investing in. So I think higher wages and uh, greater uh, training in college. I, I think the culture, though, I, I, you know, again, and I don't I don't want to I don't want you to speak for, for anybody other than yourself, Terry. But I, I mean, I think like the culture of the Savannah Police Department historically and currently is of one of low morale, you know, a, a corruption from possible to full blown provable, you know, uh, Terry, you are a leader in organizations. You've been, we're going to get to housing in a minute because that's another area of your expertise. But if you were leading an organization where your chief deputy had 45% of their employees in outright open rebellion saying this guy is horrible. I mean, don't you think that's something in that organization you'd have to take seriously? Well, I mean, in order to know the full details, probably, maybe, but again, you'd have to know what the issues are. Uh, going back to what John was talking about earlier in terms of staffing and because those are two, they're not synonymous with each other. Uh, the morale is low. It didn't doesn't sound like it's because of money. It sounds like there's some internal issues that's going on inside the department. But, you know, what John was talking about is are the citizens of the city of Savannah, Chatham County, Pula and Port Wentworth and Bloomingdale, because we just can't talk about one police department. You have to talk about all the police departments in the county. Uh, are they willing, are the, are, the, are the taxpayers willing to pay a higher taxes in order to make certain we've got appropriate staffing in law enforcement in our county? Now, with regard to whether or not um, the uh, the department that's have some some morale issues. That's really an issue that the county man or the city manager, for example, would have to deal with with the chief of police. Uh, not the um, uh, in the in the city of Savannah, for example. That is the the, the city manager, and and certainly not uh, the city officials, because that authority rests with the city manager department and not with the police, not with the, the mayor and aldermen of the city. Well, let me push back on that. Let me push back on that because Mayor Van Johnson said this at the 6th District Town Hall the other night that, you know, the police chief works for the city manager, but the city manager works for the for the council, right? That's, it's that's like true. it's like the CEO of a public corporation reporting to the board of directors, and that CEO's chief deputy is about to tank the company for corruption and, you know, bad decisions. And, and the board of directors are telling the shareholders, 
oh, hey, well, look, that's the, that's on the CEO. You know, like there's nothing we can do about it. Like, Terry, you and I both know shareholders are going to call that board into question, are going to call a shareholders meeting and are going to remove that board un unless they fire that CEO for not firing that deputy. Tell me that. Yeah. Tell me how I'm wrong here. Well, again, the 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 city uh, alderman and mayor has the authority to terminate the chief of police. And I'm not really certain what his contractual obligations are. Um, if he or she does not carry out what they think the mission should be in the city in, uh, of Savannah or the county. Um, so, yeah. Uh, however, they can't be involved in the day to day operation of that division. They certainly can fire him if that's what they choose to do. I, I'll just I'll just end I'll end the segment with this, John, because I mean, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. They don't have any business in the day to day operation. But I, I think we're, we're we're 19, 20 months into this term. I wouldn't call that a day to day thing when you've got that much time of a body to look at. Right. This isn't like a couple of weeks in like, you know, they, they've had enough time to judge his performance. Yeah, but, but but Chuck, Chuck, you got to understand now you have how many people on city council if that's the, the vision nine. that we're talking about? Nine. Yeah. Uh -huh. So you have to have enough votes in order to change uh, the city manager. No, the city I, I understand. Manager. The leverage point is look, Michael Brown, you're set to retire in, a, in five weeks, buddy. You can either fire this chief or you, you can get fired five weeks early. I mean, well, I understand it's, that that's the political choice and it's a tough well, the, one. The question is, do the people who have the votes that's necessary to make the change believe what you believe? Probably yeah. not. Probably okay. not. I, well, I mean, and I think I think the probably is, is, is increasing. Like uh, the more crime exists, the more crime increases with this chief. I, I, I'm not sure that that that'll remain true. Right. Well, in, in the in the case of what transpired with those people, that person, the persons of per, people who who shot all those people for multiple murders, yeah. um, changing the police chief wouldn't have stopped that ev event that had occurred. That wouldn't have stopped. That would have happened anyway. So the question is, what do you do to, to try and stop or prevent that kind of occurrence again? Um, because changing the, the person that sits in that chair certainly would have changed the outcome of what happened the other day. Uh, Terry, I, I, I'm uh, at the risk of prolonging this. and, and <laughs> It's a great topic. Well, no, no doubt it is, but it, it, it's not Terry's area of expertise. We're putting the, uh, the, the guy on the spot. And, I know. Uh, my point is, and let's put a tack on this, um, Terry's absolutely correct. The it, no single person in the police department, whether it's a patrol officer or the chief of police, um, is going to single-handedly uh, reduce crime or, or prevent uh, a tragedy like uh, what just happened. Um, but Terry, m my premise and my core belief is I've been here almost 30 years. Um, in my time, I have seen just phenomenal growth and prosperity, whether it's the measured by the number of SCAD students from 30 years ago to today, whether it's the number of uh, containers, TEUs trans, uh, transferring through the port in and out, um, uh, you know, tourism numbers, hotel uh, uh, new starts and builds. So uh, the poverty rate of Savannah really vacillates it, it between the the mid 20s and maybe the high 20 percent oh, 30s well uh certainly let's just call it un unchanged for all intents and purposes over the last 30 years so uh you're absolutely right we're, we're, we've got to create some sort of sustainable and enlarging middle class here and if, if that means paying a little more in taxes I'm I'm fine with paying some more in, in taxes, but, but you are you are John. But most of the citizens are not. So that's the challenge that they're not. And if you look at the history of political activities, when you get close to election time, they try hard not to increase the millage rate on people because they want to get reelected again. Well, let's be honest. But let's, so, all right, so let's move this into housing, 
and development kind of topic because you, this is where you really are an expert, Terry. I mean, you've been well, around. I, 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 I work in poverty as well. So correct. To, 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 to answer but they're the inextricably linked, right? Housing and poverty are linked. Well, and also employment. Uh, you know, it's a really big thing because how many, how much percentage of the tax base is based on on services to people who come in um, to live in hotels and motels, and you're Not talking enough. about Not enough. 20, twenty-five to thirty percent uh, of people are working in that industry, and they are getting low-wage industries. Yes, so way, you know, and so so you're going to have that. And if there were agencies like EOA or mm -hmm. uh, Salvation Army, that number would be even more higher than eighteen to twenty percent. It would be much higher than that, and so. Anyway, we, we'll get to the topic on housing if that's where you want to head at. Right well, now. I just think it's all kind of inextricably linked. You know, the excessive crime. I, I, I could make a positive argument here. I could posit an argument that today's crime wave is directly linked to the lack of housing availability and price appreciation over the last five years. You know, the less opportunity there is to, to find a sustainable living, the more crime there is ultimately going to be. And so, you know, you saw the ad up front you know, before our show started about SCAD, you know, buying up 233 affordable apartments at Chatham Apartments and then turning around in a, in a, in a, in a, in a pithy, you know, let them eat cake. Here's 21 units back, less than 10% of what they took off the rolls of available <laughs> affordable housing units. H how is that good for Chatham County and Savannah? How well, is that, that sale good for for the citizens future well well we got to go back because i had some of my clients live there we managed social security mm -hmm. recipients money and so we had uh probably over 200 and some of our people uh -huh. living in that facility um uh, that was bought by a developer outside of the city took a long time over a year to get that done uh and from my understanding it was going to be a for-profit corporation and i don't know what transpired uh and uh e even there was a big debate on that so uh, but that was people who were disabled uh, and not uh, and, and who, who paid uh, rent based on their income. So all of those units were 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 gone from the community. Uh, and in, in return, because the state statute, um, SCAD and any other nonprofit that provides certain kinds of housing based on what statute is, because that's a state requirement, that they get to buy these properties and don't have to pay taxes on them. So, and that takes it out. So, or if we're talking about getting rid of Yamacraw Village, for example, uh, what happens to those families that, that live in Yamacraw Village? And in my, in my opinion, my humble opinion is that the move is to move all of those low income people from the downtown area so that a different group of people can live in that community. Uh, and so they're constantly being forced in other directions of the county, uh, all up and down. Um, um, Bay Street, you know, you're building these really nice apartment or townhouses and where people are moving at. So it's not just SCAD. Uh, it's just the development process was going on in this entire county. Yeah. Gentrification is both a racist and market based action, right? Well, you know, I don't I, I don't know if it's so much about racism as it is about financial opportunities. Martin. People are people are having opportunities to build and people are coming into this county um, to live because we've created a a market environment where people want to move to Savannah. John, I just want to use Terry's analogy. Okay, Terry, the same way you just said about John, about how most people don't want to pay more taxes. Right. Most people, when they see an Atlanta developer buy that property and hold it for a year to sell it to SCAD, most taxpayers go, oh yeah, that's a shell game between the rich people. You call up somebody's buddy, somebody calls up somebody's buddy. Oh yeah, look, if you buy this and hold it for a year, you can make 10 million. Right. You know, so like I would just push back and say, look, I understand that there was a lot of debate about it when it happened. Most people on the ground would say, oh, yeah, that's Kabuki. That's that's that that's that one percenter class it was scratching structure. each other's back. It was a structural you know? deal. It was correct. A deal. Um, Go ahead, John. I, I, I just want to I just want to make the most uh, macro observation is that that I possibly could hear about uh, demographics change in Savannah. Terry, what it seems like is happening to me, by and large, this isn't everything, but this is a big, big part of it. Poor people, people living in poverty, like your clients in Chatham Apartments, um, they are being 
displaced outside the city limits. They are going uh, where housing is more affordable, whether it's uh, uh, Fort Wentworth or Bloomingdale, or Garden City, uh, unincorporated Chatham out, out on the south side. Their, their numbers, the numbers that are exiting are being replaced by and large by uh, white affluent uh, northerners who are retiring here. So we're, we're, I, I, I think in the next 10 years, Savannah is going to be a white majority city, like it or not. Um, and the voting base is going to be shifted um, from the exiting uh, demographic to the incoming older uh, Caucasian demographic. So that that's just, I'm, I'm not a, a de demographer, but on, on the ground, what I see happening, what I see going on on the streets behind my house, block up the block on Montgomery and Patnell is, um, you know, pricey, very expensive uh, condominiums and townhouses, which retirees by and large uh, are, are buying and moving here. So, John, let, let me just say, and I, I got a couple of statements. One is that the, the, the people you were talking about that live in Chatham apartments are not the people that's moving in, in Garden City or Port Wentworth because they can't afford to live in those houses. They were making uh, on, 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 on SSI $851 a month. So they're, they're not, there's not houses that are being built fast enough to accommodate people who need those houses. Now, to go back historically, I grew up in a place called Crawford Square. Crawford Square is the only place downtown that has a basketball court. That's where I grew up. And everybody that lived in the neighborhood primarily were tenants and we had a rent strike. And so this process of moving people and shifting people around because you don't own anything started way back then. Uh, if you go from all of the parks from Crawford Square to Green Square, all the way down to where the other park is going all the way down there because I lived down there. All those parks were recreational park, and there was a, a integrated segment of people that live in those neighborhoods. And because of funding through HUD, they were allowed to get low interest loans. And all those people that move around Crawford Square, for example, it costs a million dollars from those houses to people live in. So that's not new. So it started back then, and it's shifted its way all the way down to Grenette and even to Anderson Street. So the question is, when you displace these people, there really is not enough available, affordable houses that are being built anywhere in this county to accommodate that. So what you're going to see is a higher increase in the number of homeless people in our county. So uh, that's really the issue. And you're right. The demographics is shifting and it started not recently. It started a while back. That was, I call, a, the early plan to move people out. Okay. So <laughs> it's and it's not stopped. It's you you can you can take uh, GIS survey and you'll see dramatically how that's changing in this county and you can map it out uh, and as you'll see from East Broad to West Broad Street used to be predominantly African Americans that has greatly changed from going from all the way from Bay Street all the way down to uh, 37th Street that's drastically changed and it's now moving past 37th all the way to Victory Drive and beyond. Uh, so that that's changing very rapidly. Fair enough. Uh, the tax digest. It's in at the Department of Revenue. Have they accepted it? We have not sent that in yet. Doesn't it have to be in by mid June? No. It's June thirty first. Uh, June is the end of the month. No, that's when we have to submit all the information. We have to vote on that in July, and it has to be in the Department of Revenue uh, by the end of August. So Labor Day. It's Labor Day, John. That's what it right. is. What did? Uh, am I crazy, or did it? Is that a COVID delayed? No, thing? that's no. It's always been that way. Huh. Okay. It's, well, al it's always been. I mean, I, you know, it's since when, since I've been on the board, it's always been that way. Because um, right now, you people have received their value. They have forty five days from the time they see their value to determine if they want to appeal the value that they received. They just right. got it a few weeks ago. So, all right, well, yeah. speculate for us from what you yeah. what you've seen. How much that just growth, Terry? Uh, How much not, you know he's not going to publicly comment on that before it's supposed to. No, well, ask, me, ask me the question again now, John. Okay. Just just uh, speculate 
speculative. What percent of growth do you think, what range might that digest come in at? Well, I, I'll just say that, that the value of property has increased in most areas of the county, including hotel motels. Uh, you got to remember that um, we, we, as much as people thought that we had a decrease in, 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 in most neighborhoods because of, and this won't happen until next year, it's going to increase even more next year. Sure. sure. Uh, because, because, <coughs> think of my dog, because um, uh, people, are buying, people are buying property that's <coughs> unbelievable. <laughs> So my, my, it's okay. my grand, I have a dog. It's okay. Well, he's he's barking at my grandson. I, could you take him in the room for me? Yeah, you got he, to go, in the room. go take him in the room for me, Keisha. I'm sorry. Go okay. ahead. Um, <laughs> well, look. Let me let me ask the question this way: Do you think it'll be single digit or double digit growth? Then we'll move on. A bit single digit growth, yeah. but that's yeah. still significant. That's still significant. There's oh. a lot of there's a lot of building that's going on in downtown Savannah, and there's a lot of building in unincorporated county, uh, and places like you were talking about in Port Wentworth, people are building in those areas, and and one would think because of the pandemic that it would slow down, but it really has not slowed down. Yeah, we we noticed that by tracking the uh, city of Savannah uh, building permit values, and. I've got Halfway through the uh, <clears throat> halfway through the COVID year, uh, at the end of July, well, seven, it's up on the screen, John. Yeah, yeah. I see it. Yeah, uh, you know, we were we were not going to be uh, impacted hardly at all for uh, the COVID year of uh, 2020. So we're we're gonna come in pretty close to seven hundred. I think we finished. I think that Stephanie uh, or or what's her name, the the budget person. I think she said it was like five hundred ninety or something for the year. Maybe it was between eighteen and nineteen. They said okay. it wasn't. They didn't do more than nineteen because of no you know, COVID. I, I, but I, they 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 finished out more than eighteen. I think is what it was. So Terry, we one of our core policies that we've been advocating for is impact fees on all new development. OK, structured in a way that, you know, incentivizes lower single family and multifamily development for affordable housing units. And at, you know, at a range, you know, the, the median home price is two hundred sixty five, two hundred seventy five thousand dollars in this county now. Um, that's not affordable housing. And so by not having impact fees, I think we're over incentivizing that type of development, which is not going to do anything for the issues that all of us really care about, right? So do you think that we really missed an opportunity the last 25 years to have that policy in place to absorb revenue to offset the costs of this infrastructure to support the development? Beyond, to be honest with you, that's one of the areas I have a little bit of information on in terms of what impact fees are, because all we do is just set values. Yeah. Um, so I, I, don't, I really couldn't answer that. I wouldn't want to get into that um, that area that I don't really have expertise on. I don't know. All right. Let, let me, let me try uh, a question. <clears throat> Do you think in this uh, 2021 digest that the percent percentage of tax exempt property is going to be stable uh, up or down from 2020? It, it, it may be, it will, well, it may be up. stable. It may be stable. It may go up because uh, I'm not really certain when, SCAD start building and purchasing their property that was last year, then certainly it's going to uh, go up. Uh, there are, because um, every year in the tax assessor's office, uh, there is a reevaluation of people who have uh, exemption for, uh, as a non for profit corporation. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, it, it, except for maybe some increases because of SCAD, they were not a great one. Okay. Let's talk about SCAD, John. Go ahead. Go now, ahead, John. but but and, 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 before we right, but, but 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 I, you know, on your on your on your initial views that came up when you were talking when we opened up the program, it talked about SCAD not paying taxes. That is that is a decision that your state legislators need to deal with in Atlanta, Georgia. Oh, okay. we agree. We agree, hundred okay. percent. Yeah. 
Yeah, we're we're not tagging you with that. Yeah. I know you're not. I know you're not. I'm just saying, just as in general, as information to people sure. who are listening to the program need to I know. I think what that. he's saying is he understands the criticism and and understand it's a legitimate criticism. So Terry, you know, we've been pushing SCAD. You know, we've been pushing you know a campaign out. You know, that is our our goal is to get them to come to the table with the school board, the county, and the city, and and develop a pilot program. Payment well, in lieu of taxation. They could they could just simply grab all the public relations brownie points and get ahead of this instead of making us go through the long slog of fighting with the legislature. Well, I mean, you'd have to do that with every educational institution in the city. No, because every yeah, every educational institution that have real property is exempt from taxes, as well as some of the other exemptions that occur all over the county from. Um, people who have property on airport land because it's the state statute allows them not to be taxed for their for, for real property because they don't own the land. Terry, how many of other those institutions have the amount of land holding SCAD does? I mean, I mean, any, any of them come anywhere close? Well, I mean, but but it's, it's not about how much they have. I'm not I'm not defending SCAD or anybody else because that's not my issue. The issue is if you're going to make the rule, you have to make the rule across all of them. What do you think Savannah's well, going to look like if SCAD doubles the amount of property they have in the next 15 years? Well, that means that that means just like when you do the tax allocation district where, you, OK, uh, <laughs> all right. It's going to look like everybody else is going to pay. Every time you vote to give somebody a tax break, you give you make everybody else pay for a tax increase. Thank you. Terry. So so. You know, that's really the bottom line is that every time and, and, and politicians will come to the community, I come to uh, with these special uh, referendums and asking for us to vote for a tax. Increase. Free for it. Free for it. Yeah. I mean, so if if you're giving people who are bringing tax, uh, bringing um, um, goods into our county and they don't have to pay taxes on the, the those stuff. Then that's going to happen. And they got smart enough. They make it. They're making now warehouses outside of the county, so they can drive stuff out. So they have to pay taxes. Yeah, that's right. Terry, I, I don't think you were uh, on the board, but uh, you know, twenty years ago, uh, before they wrote special legislation for for Gulfstream and aircraft, uh, on December thirty first, Gulfstream would fly all their aircraft out to Alabama for the night, so that they could. Uh, legitimately file a, a return with greatly reduced no inventory. So uh, the legislature get, get well. I mean, yeah, the legislature said wherever you have your airplane stored at, that's where you have your taxes. So if their ta if their airplanes are not stored in Savannah, there's no taxes on them. I mean, so listen, <laughs> what y'all what you need to do is make certain that your legislators, okay? <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Right? I mean, you know, know, you're talking, you know, the legislators change these rules all the time, you know. Um, and so, you know, if, 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 you know, you're talking to people who, you know, the city and county government, they're not the ones that's doing these rules. That's, yeah, that's in yeah. Atlanta. And, and if you want to talk, you, you said y'all had uh, uh, Lester Jackson. And is y'all asking that question? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, he's for a limit, I think a cap on the amount of, of non proper, you know, a cap on it would be fair, I think, is his position. But, you know, let me ask you about the about the, what the rules are now. All right. Is there a way under the current paradigm under state law for these dorm rooms from SCAD to be taxed? Because that's not for an educational purpose. That's a that's a that's commercial property. You know, like. Uh, well, no, no, it's, it is. It, it, well, you know, the, the legislation has changed now. Those dorms are not commercial. They belong to SCAD. Now, what some people who used to rent out property to SCAD students tried to get an exemption because they said that they were providing that for SCAD students. But we killed it, okay, because that's not legislation. Uh, we can't change legislation. The legislation yeah. is what it is. And if and when the legislators change that, then we because our job is as, as tax assessors is to ensure that we follow the rules of the state statute. John knew it. I think, John, wouldn't you on the tax assessors board one time? No, I was on the county commission. County commission. So uh, but, you know, you, you have to 
follow the rules. And so certainly we try to make certain we follow every single thing that they have. And so, like I said, there were people who tried to get us to give them an exemption because they were renting property to um, scared students. Like, no, it's not, that's not going to happen. Yeah. Hey, I, and, I, I, I've got... Uh, it sounds to me like Georgia is like the best property, best state in which to do uh, tax fraud in, you know? Well, I mean, well, you I know, guess because I mean, is, I mean, I, it sounds like I could just start a nonprofit company, just start buying up properties, you know, pay no taxes, pay my insurance. You no, know, if you no, no, that's not what it is. If you have a, the, the this has been around f since beginning of time. If you're providing housing for people who uh, need affordable housing, you get a tax break. And so, but if you have housing that's mixed, like if you've got some of your property are for fee paying people and those who are getting subsidies, the only a portion of those apartments are not uh, are not taxable. Right. The other part are taxable. So uh, well, that system's that, been working great. I tell you, yeah. you know, with lots of well, obviously. The, the thing is, the question is, are there other ways that you can get entities like SCAN and other places to? maybe enter a fee. And but that's, a, no, again, the legislature can come up with that. It's the court of public opinion. No, that's exactly it, John. If, they, if we can't get, honestly, Terry, you know as well as we, as we do, we can't win in the court of the legislature. It's it's dominated by one party. And beyond that, it's dominated by sellouts and money and lobbyists. You already know that as well as we do. Wait, so no, like I the mean, only that, other better well, place to prosecute them is in the court of public opinion. And well, just but, show the people that this is what this is like. Well, then maybe you have to, well, I mean, that's on one side, but there are local legislations that, that are passed in state legislature. And so the question is, how many people in the state legislators do you have that support or don't support yeah. these yeah. ideas? Well, and, look, look, yeah. Let me ask Terry, uh, I, I've got a stack of questions for you here. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid I'm not going to get through them all. Um, but Quickly, uh, fr from your knowledge base, do you think it's possible if the local delegation, could they write a local act under local legislation that could cap the amount of value that any one exempt organization could uh, own tax exempt in one county? I don't know if that they can do that because there are tax assessors who have different roles than we do in Chatham County. Uh, and when we meet annually uh, in Atlanta, I mean, in, in Athens, that's always been a question. And of course, the, the tax um, commissioner for the state of Georgia, the Department of Revenue, has always been very vague about how you can do that because if you pass one bill like that, that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody that's on the state legislature is going to go along with it because that means they're concerned that that might have an issue back in, in, in their areas as well. Um, I'm sure that most county government and city governments would like to get additional revenue. Now, the question becomes, how do you get the legislators to agree to do that? Agreed. Okay. Well, you know what, John? Let me let me put something out here. This is why Eddie Deloach and crew, who were you know, kind of kind of, they had the right idea with the wrong mindset. What they should have done was they should have passed a fire fee, John, that would have gone. That they, they, they could have, they could have said that uh, all single family uh, uh, homes uh, would be a dollar, right? Uh, yeah. All multifamily homes will be five dollars and then like and then just just put it all on the commercial properties you know and i understand that the churches would have had an upfit regardless but you know again like we can't we can't have you know nothing on them and something on scan i understand terry's point there but that was the problem with that fire fee was they they lumped the homeowners and the and the and the and the investors renting out property in as the same problem as scad and that wasn't going to fly yeah, I agree with you, Chuck. The fire fee was uh, conceptually not terrible. Uh, impl implementation, dreadful. Yeah. And misunderstanding, uh, galore. What's Terry, your next question, John? Let me ask you this, Terry. How many, about how many parcels are there in the city of Savannah? Is it about 66,000? 
Now you you would ask me that question. I don't really have it off. I think the top it's eighty eight thousand, John. I think it's eighty eight thousand. Well, I know in the in the county all together, it's like one hundred and thirty thousand parcels all right. throughout the whole county. So I'm not really certain how many there are in the in the city of Savannah. If I if I knew that question, I'd have it for you, but I didn't. No, I no, let, let's just for conversation's sake, uh, split it in the middle and say there's about you know under seventy thousand parcels in the city of Savannah. Um, how many staff members do you have, Terry? Mm, about 60, 50, 60, something like that. Yeah. yeah. And, do, do and, you, uh, uh, huh? How does that compare to other uh, borders? How does that compare to Athens, Clark County, or Columbus, Muskogee? Well, according to, according to uh, our staffing, our chief executive officer, the chief appraiser, uh, we're, we're lower. Because yeah. we do a lot of counties now, you have to do this. The, some counties hire contractors to do the work that we do. We don't do it. We do all of our work ourselves. And so, when you're trying to compare apples to oranges, you got to understand. I'm not really certain how Athens Clark County does it because there are some counties actually hire outside companies to do their evaluation of property. All right. Well, Terry, let let, let me tell you the background real quick on this. Um, I've called down several times and talked to staff. Oh, um, I'm sure he knows that already, John. No, no, they no, no, I don't. Go ahead. That's nice. Chuck, I'm just messing with you, buddy. I'm just messing with you. Um, and, uh, you know, they've been very, very helpful, very, very uh, uh, attentive. Uh, and, and so I, I get down the line in a conversation about a specific subject. And, you know, you know what they, Tell me, Terry, is uh, they're short staffed. They 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 would like to do it the way it's supposed to be done, but there's not enough of them to, you know, properly you know revalue all property every three years or review the tax exempt uh, legitimacy for these uh, properties that are are exempt. Um, and I, I, well, well, John, John, let me let me just say this before you go any further. All right. We we meet every every month, well, twice a month, twice a month, uh, and uh, that has not come up as as an issue with us. Uh, we're uh, we have uh, probably three or four positions that are open, and they're top level positions, and not the men on the boots on the ground. Uh, so, and of course, uh, we submit a budget to. The county every year as do other departments sure. um, and um, of course certainly that is uh, we would like to have more staffing um, but because of technology actually what we do is not as intense as it used to be um, so if there is a need that certainly has not been been raised as an issue at any of our board meetings okay well uh did you did did the department asked for an increase last year and did it get it or not? Well, we asked for items that we needed and most of what we asked for, we did receive. And what we generally need is transportation to get to and from to make certain that we have appropriate transportation to get to uh, the sites to, uh, to, to put value on properties. And when we had some special issues as it relates to Elba Island, we did get everything we asked for because we needed to do some extra work for Elba Island. Well, you had to outsource that, right? Yeah, I mean, we had to outsource that, but we still had to put people on staff to work along with them. Right. And at, at, at the end of the day, the resolution with Elba is going to be a huge windfall for the county, right? Well, yeah, it will be It will be uh, what we call making certain that everybody property is valued fairly. Well, and well, that's, that was what our, our role was. And when when I got on there, that was not the case, and so we 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 uh, uh, got uh, permission from the past county commissions to engage a third party who had expertise, and that was because we went to some training out outside of the city and found that there were some third party companies that could help out with that situation. But again, we're doing that with everything that we can to make certain that is. Because the more we can get people to pay to their property to be the fair share, yeah, you know, fairly valued, that that decreases what uh, taxpayers have to pay. Now you have to remember 
However, that if a county or a city or a school board decides to increase or pay for other services, then that makes it a tighter budget. Uh, uh, okay, but uh, you, you can only back bill for two years. On I, Can you back bill for taxes? If no, we can back up to three years, not two years, three okay. years. Right, did, and, and that's if if we determined that there was an error on our part that we made a mistake yeah. or any other issue. So um, um, but we can't back bill beyond that. And, and a taxpayer can actually request a return on what they consider over taxation from any entities going back three years. Now, they can certainly do it beyond that. But that's a county commissioner or a city of Savannah, a school board. Thing. Okay, so, so it cuts both ways three years, uh, either right. to add on or, or to give back. Right. <clears throat> Did uh, Elba Island, uh, we go back three years and, and get some pocket change there? I have no idea. All we did was set the value. The, the, the negotiation about what their taxes were would have been with the county and the tax commissioner's office. The, it's well, probably the county, in the the arts office. Yeah, well, the tax commissioner, now we worked along to make certain that we came to an understanding what that value would be over the years because we stayed uh, in negotiation for several years on that. Yeah, well, what was the the spread? What Wasn't it like over 50% undervalued? <laughs> Again, I can't remember exactly. Um, certainly it's open to the public, but um, there were some debate between what they considered the value and what we determined the value to be. All right. Uh, Chuck, that's unincorporated Chatham County, so it's got no no nickels or dimes. For this. Yeah, yeah, but it's still school board should get some money, and uh, the the county M and O budget should get some money, right? I mean, it should so, be a lot since it's three years. M and O uh, and SSD, it's special service district, but they still pay school taxes, don't they? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, Jerry, uh, I'm going to bring it back home to a small level. I got my uh, assessment notice. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're quite welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, how long have uh, taxpayers been able to file an online appeal? I can't remember. It's probably three or four years, maybe longer than that. We started a while back um, because um, that was the trend in which we thought was better for people that they can file an online appeal. They certainly can still come into office as well, right. but it's been it's been a while. Uh, and it takes people a while to understand how that works. Oh, uh, baby, does it? Terry, let, let, let me share with you. And I, I know you're not personally responsible for this, but um, I, I tried to file an online appeal to save myself a trip down and carrying one. Terry, it took me an hour and 45 minutes, two calls to your staff, and 15 uh, uh links and page transfers. Hello, are you frozen? No, I'm, I'm, no. I'm waiting for your face. <laughs> 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 I don't know. <laughs> Buddy, it's not very user friendly. Well, I mean, if somebody would tell us, then we would try to correct it. You know, with technology, you think you got it all squared up right. We don't know. And so if there's issues. Thank you for bringing that to me. And I certainly will bring that to the attention of staff. But sure. the intent, the intent of the tax assessor's office is to try to make this as user friendly as possible so that people can get it and not make it difficult. And if there is some kind of glitch in that software system, we certainly need to straighten that out. Well, it's it's kind of like trying to get reception back when you had an antenna, and and you had to like position it just the right way to get. The well, John, John, you think maybe you might have some problems with your internet provider? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I I will check with them to make certain that. That there is no issues because if there's issues, we certainly will. Let me, I want to make a point here, John. I want to make a point. Terry, Terry has said this a couple times today, and he's making an extremely good point about, about the politics in Savannah and Chatham County. You have to go through the mechanics. It's like uh, it's like the fundamentals in basketball or baseball, right? You got to bunt, you got to steal. You know what he's saying is is 
there has to be an organized effort in front of the you know in front of the tax assessor board, right? They've got to see that it's got to be in their minutes, right? Over and over and over, and that and that's how change happens, right? Well, 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 well the thing is, the thing is, no, if if this is an issue, that no, that would take be taken care of because. Our mission at the tax is, is to give the benefit of the doubt to the taxpayers. And so if whatever we're doing to you that's not making it easier for you to, to, to file an appeal, then it's on us and we need to make certain we get it straight. Okay. I'm just saying if at every public meeting for a year straight of the tax assessors board, there was a group of 35 citizens complaining about SCAD not paying their fair share. I'd imagine that you guys would be on the legislature, the legislative delegation's tail a lot no, more no. because you'd be getting beat up about it. No, actually, nobody's been complaining to us because we don't determine it. That is, that would be the tax. That would be, that would actually be the requirement of, of your state legislators. We, 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 all we do is carry out legislative mandates. Well, <clears throat> Terry, I think the <clears throat> the quickest way for you, if I may suggest is yes. ask your staff to run a report <clears throat> on how many people filed an online appeal. Well, they do. They they bring that to us. Actually, we had a meeting this past Thursday, and they bring it to us about how many people filed an online appeal. Every time we meet, they'll do an yep. appeal series, and they'll tell us that, either online or in person. Uh, and the numbers were about the same as it was last year, and we still have a few more days to go. So I will find out. If there has been, if somebody called in and said that there was a glitch in the system, that they were having a difficult time getting their appeals in. Well, uh, it, okay. I, I think the the better context or question <clears throat> is if you're getting two uh, percent online. I'm just making these numbers up, Terry. If you get two percent of uh, taxpayers filing an online appeal with the complexity. Uh, and, and the rigors that are hardwired into the current software um, with the more simplified, streamlined, user-friendly, you, you, you might see 15%. So whatever the number is, I understand they're giving you a report, but it's got to be put in some sort of context to understand the relevance or the significance of the number. Well, they'll compare it to what this time, like if they, when they give us a report, they'll say, Based on the time from last year to this time, this is how many uh, appeals we had, yeah, both then, in person and uh, electronically. Okay, but did you have? You probably had the same software system last year, so I don't know. No, it's it's changed. We changed up a little bit because you know we use uh, this one particular company because we own them all the time about about problems that we have with the system. So if there are some ch some challenges, then certainly we need to bring it to their their attention. Okay, fair enough. I, I want to talk about the Richard Arnold building on Montgomery Street. It's actually uh, a uh, Richard Arnold building on Montgomery. Richard Arnold was on Bull Street. Uh, that was my high school. Three fifteen West Thirty Eighth Street. It's actually I'm sorry, it's the St. James Preparatory Academy, or, or it was the St. Andrews Preparatory Academy. One of them. Yeah, it's uh, one of them. It's one of them. Uh, Saint what Paul, Richard Arnold because Richard Arnold was on Bull Street. I'm sorry, my apologies. Saint right. Paul Academy. Saint Paul Academy. That's on 38th or 39th Street off Montgomery Street. 38th Street in Montgomery, 315 West 38th Street. Um, right across from Muncie's Barbecue. It was a great barbecue joint. Um, Scad bought this Terry in 2014. They paid uh, $900,000 for it. Um, your, the 2020 value was $839,000. How in the world does a property, after seven years of appreciation, uh, drop you know, 5% of its value o over seven years. Well, as you know, property value is determined by different things. And I'm certainly not the expert in that, but I certainly can find out if somebody bought a piece of property next to me right now, where I live at and they, and the property value is uh, $500,000 and they 
pay it $400,000, that automatically reduces the value of my property. Generally, what the tax assessor's office use is Marshall and Swift numbers to determine value, even, even depreciation. Now, I don't know. They also do a visual inspection of the property as well. Um, so, um, but certainly I could check on that. Okay. But, um, but, but <clears throat> property he's values don't remain the same way. He's making your next point for you, John. Yeah. Okay. So, 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 for example, at EOA, okay, at EOA, we have a building that that was valued at uh, two hundred, three, four point five million dollars, and it went up to five point eight million dollars this year. Another building was reduced by about half a million dollars because of deterioration. So you could see the difference, but it's close proximity to each other. And the, and the year in which they were built were different. The building on Anderson Street was built in 1913. The other one was built in 2002. So it, it depends. And, okay. And so, so well, because that, that's a commercial, commercial building. Specifically, Terry, it was never used. They put fencing around it, boarded it up, and it sat vacant since 2015. Now, Seven years. According according to your uh, audit selection criteria, exempt properties, Chatham County Board of Assessors, um, your, your own policy says that properties that are currently enjoy an exemption status for educational institution shall retain their exemption for a two-year period from the date of the exemption. If the property has no improvements on it or signs of improvement being taken, the exemption shall be removed. What what happened with the? Uh, I think what he's saying, what John's saying, is shouldn't they, if they started paying taxes on that property three or four years ago after the sat for four years? John, John, and Chuck, I didn't know anything about that that issue, so I certainly would check into it. That you know, based on what you just said, that seems to be a, a true fact. Okay. So, and, 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 so here's a better there, question. There is. How do we put a lien on the sale? Because they're selling that property. Do we get the Commissioner Jackson to put a lien on the sale of that property for not having had a tax bill sent to them for the last three cycles because we can go back three years? No, I don't know. I mean, that that is a, a decision that, that they would have to make. The question is, can, and I guess that's the question you asked me, can you go back three years? So, yes. <laughs> so, so you prepare me for that question. Okay. Um, I'm not really certain, but I certainly will bring that up to uh, the chief appraiser to find out what happened because we're supposed to review uh, exempt properties every three years to make certain that they qualify. So, so we know, so Terry, they are under contract to sell that property. We do not know for how much yet, but as you know, it will be a public record when it closes. Okay. So, you know, I think the question for taxpayers is, how is it fair for SCAD to get, to be a real estate investment trust, hold that property, pay no taxes on it? Because you know they are not going to sell it for 900000 They're going to sell it for like $1.5 million, right? You know, it's going to have appreciation built into it when they sell it. So I just don't think how, I think everybody's just like, that's not fair, you know? Like the taxpayers, a, a single taxpayer, an individual doing that same thing would not get away with that. Do you agree with that? If I just bought a property, sat on it, you know, I would get a blight tax. I would get something, you know, from the city or the county in if, retaliation. If, if, if it was, if it was not a, if it was a taxable property, and, and based on what John is saying to me, that exactly. we still have it on the part on the on the books as an exempt property. Yes. Yeah, so, so my, my problem is uh, in the first cycle, if no uh, educational activity was going on or uh, major renovation, um, it, it probably should have lost its exemption and be put on, on the rolls for a tax bill. Um, yeah. It says in number seven in uh, the Chatham County uh board of assessors exemption criteria policies it, it says number seven says all exempt entities are subject to site interior inspection to verify the documented use of the property um 
It says subject to. That means that they they subject. That means that they selected. They would have. They can go in and look at it. Yeah. 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 Um, How does a property like that not get selected over three well, cycles? Chuck, this is. Let me interrupt you, Terry. This dovetails back into the conversation I shared with you. I, I asked your staff, how did this happen? And that's when I was told, we don't have enough people to keep track of everything that's going on. And the tax exempt properties even less so because they don't really pay taxes. So we're taking the highest and best use of the resources and staff that we have for taxable Property. Which is personal. I mean, for the staff is a personal, yeah. personal, per perfectly logical response, John. Yeah, I understand okay. that. In the real world, man, that's a great answer. I'm, I've got no problems with that answer. But we're in the theoretical world today, so let's talk about what we really want. Well, the the question is, uh, and you're asking me, the technically the staff is supposed to look at every property every three years, the exempt properties, and there is a specific department that handles only exempt properties not everybody in the in the department do sure so certainly uh, and, and whether it's churches or nonprofits uh, the question is um, that somehow they did not check to see if that property has been changed like sometimes a church will get a, a vacant lot and say they're going to use for parking well right. they have a certain specific period of time in order for that to occur and they have to do a visual inspections to make certain that that happened but do you have any other properties that you know of that I need to, you know, because of certainly um, uh, I'm not, I, that's the first time I've heard of, of that particular building having an issue. No, I think, I think, I think what we need is commissioner a dot Whiteley or uh, commissioner Gator rivers. You know, when you listen to this episode, find out what the part sub group inside the department is responsible for this. They, Go to the do, Chatham County budget next year and increase that line item by a hundred percent. Well, they what they can do is if we can they can find out they can give us additional staff people for that purpose, but they can't come in and run the department. No, no, I'm with. saying, I'm saying, like, all right, if, if they say, okay, we're going to give you, you know, three hundred fifty thousand dollars more in 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 budget to hire, but we want at least two hires going towards non-exempt towards exempt property you know you don't think that's that's not that's legislative it's legislative demand off of the money well i mean that is a a, a thing that local could do and, and of course we have put on the table before in the past uh the fact that we need to reevaluate all properties in the county in terms of any one of them that we have missed because there are some properties for whatever reason that we may have missed that that makes certain that their properties is valued the right way. You know, everything from people who have an exemptions on their property, if they have exemption in other counties. Um, so, uh, and, and I think we have brought that before the commissioners. Before, uh, I'd like at least to the um, the county manager, not necessarily this particular uh, county commissioners, but certainly in the past. Sure. With, yeah. Well. Uh but, but John, thank you for, for yeah. sharing that with me. I wish you had said that to me before you talked to me on this phone, this thing here today, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, well, um, okay. I, I've got one other thing to share with you, but if you want, I'll, I'll share it offline. Um, just well, to we're, we're getting ready to wrap up here anyway. You've been super generous with your time. I mean, you know. Well, well, let me let me just let me just add this one little thing since you know we talk about taxes. Let's talk about EOA just for one quick minute. Sure. Because um, we, you know, that's one we haven't talked about. We are doing this um, big bucket giveaway for uh, hurricanes uh, with International Paper helping us out. We're doing fifteen hundred buckets so that low income people will at least be prepared in the event that there is a uh, hurricane that's coming into Savannah. Um, and, and and we serve a lot of poor people in our, our community. Uh, we've served probably over 6,000 people who need energy assistance. Uh, our Head Start Center serves 600 children in this county, which are not our children, but they belong to the citizens of Chatham County. Um, so I just wanted to put that in there since uh, I do. That's where I spend most of my time at uh, at EOA. I gotta, I gotta give you a book to read, Terry. 
Okay, it's it's called it's called Winners Take All by Anon Girdadas. All right, because you know, I know that that's a solid program you're doing. I know that, but when I hear hurricane preparedness bags brought to you by international paper, right? Like I think of how many battles did you guys have with international paper over the years, John, over them paying their fair share. Aren't you, aren't you critically known for that one issue, John? Isn't that kind of part of your lore at Tim County? Well, I, I'm known for, for that and being uh, thrown out of a board of justice meeting by the sheriffs. <laughs> yeah. I don't uh, think Terry – that wasn't Terry's board, though. No, no, I got no, no, no. Too, too bad. No, we, we, you know, we, we actually told them they need to pay their fair share in, in value because they Good. wanted to take us to court. And we said, no, that's not going to work because they needed, you know, because they had an issue out there. They thought they could be exempt from, from putting some more stuff in. And I said, listen, because the law says that you can be exempt by building up your your um, your 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 company uh, by increasing the number of staff. Well, they didn't increase staff with about three or four people. And we said, no, you, you couldn't <laughs> get that exemption. So, you know, we watched very carefully on that. So, John, what was that last question you wanted to ask me? Um, let's. Uh let me save it till we wrap the show up. We'll stick yeah. that in the okay. We'll, we'll, we'll talk for just a second. But look, I, I just want to say, like, I really appreciate you setting aside. I mean, I would, I would consider you the father of the tax digest in Chatham County right now. So on Father's <laughs> Day, I appreciate you setting aside some time uh, for our audience. You know, usually around you know a thousand to two thousand people will will listen or view the show. You know, at some point, you know, and so we we, we really appreciate your sharing your expertise. Um, just kind of my final question for you. I've, I've, you know, you, you've been around Savannah a long time and, and we are kind of first and foremost, a, a show and a, and a page and a, and a, and a group organization focused on connecting the politics to the policies. Um, where do you think Savannah is right now politically and where we're headed? A lot of people are focused on some of the divisions on city council. I know that, you know, many of these people. Uh, for a long time, uh, what are your general? What's your general feel for the current political climate in Savannah? I don't think it's different than any any other time, and I had to give a lot of thought to that um, before. And that you you need all the divergent views that you have on any organization. I mean, it's going to happen. I mean, it just just going to happen. And you need people like uh, Alicia Blakely to raise cane and to talk about issues that affect people in a community. And it's important that, and, and I will have to tell you, I known Alicia, I've served on her campaign before, and she reminded me of a, a lady who grew up in, in my neighborhood around Crawford Square and her fiance, and that was his mama called Alfreda Mitchell, and she didn't take any stuff. And I told I told I told Hollis that he was uh, dating his mama. But the thing <laughs> the thing is that um, and I have been known in the past of 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 challenging things in a community because it becomes necessary because everybody sits at a table representing a certain segment of the population. And, and I've said earlier when we first started talking that just little things that people don't take they take for granted, like people walking in, in, in the lanes in downtown Savannah, that people will say, well, why are you walking the lane? We're going to take you to jail because you can't walk in the lane. But you can do the same thing in other parts of the city. Or if you're talking about housing, because you brought that up, that uh, for, for over the last 30 something years, uh, West Savannah and, and Cloverdale and Carver Village and, and, and Tatumville look like third world countries. And so, You've had a mixture of both Republicans and Democrats sitting on city council and nothing has changed dramatically in those neighborhoods. We have a hard degree of poverty in our community and it needs to change. And but because we have this new group of people coming into the community who view things totally different, thinks that people like certain people stand up and say we have some issues in our community and for whatever reason, like we got Juneteenth as if somehow that makes a big difference. Certainly doesn't do that for me, but it is, there are some real big serious issues in our community. Poverty is certainly one of them. It doesn't go away. Uh, as long as people are still making the minimum wage, that's gonna be a big challenge for us in our community. Uh, but I think the debate is good, that people need to keep bringing it up to, to the table, even with people, if they disagree. 
it should never be stopped because uh, if that's the case, then Martin Luther King's issue and Malcolm X and all of those issues who wanted to talk about those issues would not have gotten us to this point in our life in, in this country. And so we need the voices of everybody at the table, whether they agree or not. And I don't think we should say kumbaya and say uh, this is it because you and John are, are voices like that. And, and we just have to keep saying that over and over again, because if we don't do it, people won't make a change. Agreed. And so, um, yeah, and, and even working at EOA, I've gone before city council in the past and asked about housing and people have told me that I, I need to, to be quiet. And I don't really believe that, you know, because there is some real serious issue for poverty in our community. Yes. And it is a very serious problem for poverty, for poor people, for women in particular. And so uh, I think that is a big issue. And if we don't address it, crime will continue. Issues will continue to happen in our community and especially among young African-American males in our community. And so, well, Terry, I hear what you're saying. And what I hear are two camps out there kind of generally. Right. Not just at city council. I'm seeing this with some new delegation members, with some new commissioners, you know, younger people stepping up into the political arena. There, there, there's this camp that says, oh, hey, I, I hear what you're saying. I recognize the totality of these social problems. But look, I have a better Band-Aid. And if we just partner more with United Way and International Paper, and if we yeah. just prop the, we have to continue to prop these companies up, they'll do something for us that will help us solve the problem. I don't, I don't think that. We have 30% growth over the next 15, 20 years and expect we're going to have these solutions done. You know, the, the, th the thing is that, you know, these, these, these institutions, I told one person I know for a long time, he came and talked to me. Um, Tom Kohler asked me something. He said, could I have lunch with you? I said, sure, Tom. And he said, tell me how you think we've been doing over these years since you and I started our, our career doing the same thing in the community. I said, well, Tom, let me explain to you. And I thank you for inviting me to dinner since you were paying for it. Uh, <laughs> I said, but Tom, let me just say that. I said, you are now partnering with the institutions that we need to fight. And um, and, and even with United Way, I served on United Way board. And I, I remember trying to get, and I'm not mad with United Way. Um, and we've been doing business in the community, serving the poor for over 50 something years. And United Way's job at one time was just to gather funds uh, to give to community in institutions to do it. And so they asked me, well, I need you to go. The city gave some money to United Way to, to pay rent. And I said, I don't know why I need to go to United Way. And EOA has been doing this forever. I don't know why I have to go through them to, to tell me what I need to do to provide services to poor people in the community. I'm not mad with them. But we have always done this, that somehow, excuse my expression, somehow people think because of the color of the person's skin that they can deliver services better to the people who need to be served rather than the people who've been doing this for a long time. And that that draws the line, not just from the white community, but the black community. As it well. goes both ways. It goes both ways. Yeah. But United Way never fails to put a former head of CETA or a banker in charge, you know, that's going to serve the broader you know, interests of their class, of that well, because, high upper class. Well, because their philosophy is this. You got to remember that their philosophy of raising money is this, that they raise money for the purpose of they get people who serve on certain boards, like if they get somebody from the city of Savannah that, so that they can call people in the city of Savannah. They call doctors like Dr. Zolo, he was on their board and they had him. So that's their model for raising money. Right. Uh, that, I, that's I, I, just, I just view it like it's a model of like McDonald's. It's like it's like, uh, oh, here's some you know food for hunger from McDonald's. Don't know. Don't pay attention to the fact that we're giving diabetes to, you know, 50 percent of the neighborhood. You know, like that's yeah. the whole logic. It's like whitewashing all these corporate names locally so that we don't go after them. You know, well, for, the, the thing is the fair same. share. The same thing with banks. Why do we have so many um, payday loans? It's because the same companies that we have payday loans or all these other kind of loans is because the banks. We securitize them, of course. You already the know. Bank, no, no, because the banks won't let poor people in the bank to cash their checks. That's right. <laughs> That's right. right. 
That's okay, right. and these are the banks that are on. These are the these are the same people that are on the same institutions that run them. So of course, yeah, and I we're mean, the same banks that at the end of two thousand and eight begged for every ounce of money from the treasury to be saved. Oh, I'm hundred well, percent with you there. I ain't mad with you. I know you work at a bank too, but I, you I know, know that's. <laughs> so I'm just saying, you know, we have this divergent of ideas. And, and, and the question is that there are some challenges in our community that needs to be addressed. And so, uh, and it takes everybody in the community to work together and they're gonna be different opinions and they continue, need to continue. Yeah, it's, I think you uh, should be the you should be the head of United Way, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> well, I don't I don't think my hair is straight enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I will tell you, one guy lost his job because he had curly hair at United Way, and they, people don't know that story. But he, his hair wasn't straight enough. What's that song? What's that song? The sign said, uh, "Long haired." Uh, uh, Freaky hair, people don't need not apply, you know. Right, uh, right, don't don't apply, right. baby. I got right, it. I got right. it. Well, Terry, it's been uh, it's been an honor and pleasure to yeah. have you on. I mean, this is a fascinating conversation. I can't wait. Uh, we're gonna release this on Thursday of this week. It's it's Father's Day. We're recording this. Well, this well let's just but. say that that I'll, you just increase the number of people who think I'm I'm off the chain sometimes. So that's good. No, oh, thank you. hey, look, we're we're in that club together. Okay? <laughs> we need to get jackets like you know, like this is undergrad, and and you know, call it the the off the chain crew. Okay, uh, but, uh, but I, I hope you and Zazu have go have some fun. No, Zazu try to jump up and get my head off the table because he's yeah, ready to go outside. I'm gonna play a video out of the of the recording here, and then uh, we'll Zazu. be in the green room. Okay, Zazu. Zazu. Thanks, Thanks so much. I'll be right back to you guys.